So let's not lose any more time. There will be more people joining, but we will start. Good afternoon, everyone, or maybe good morning, depending on where you are on, on the world. Um, we we're very, very happy to welcome you to today's webinar about Transcribus. My name is Flo. I am mainly working in operations here with the Transcribus team. And together with my colleague Sarah and Helene, today we will um, go through the Transcribus web interface together with you and explain you everything that you need to know to use Transcribus in the web. So let's have a quick look at what we'll, on what we will talk about today. Um, first, we will have a quick look at what Transcribus is and who is behind Transcribus or the cooperative behind Transcribus. We will have a look at the new Transcribus interface, go through the workflow and how to use Transcribus in the web app, and then also on how to train your own custom AI models. And finally, there's a small section about the new upcoming subscription plans. And then of course, there's also room for questions. And questions is already uh, yeah, a good keyword. If there are any questions, just add them to the, to the chat. We will do our best to address them all. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions that come up during the webinar, just enter them in the chat. And then at the end of this webinar, we will um, yeah, try to answer uh, yeah, almost all of them. So uh, depending on how many there are. And of course, we will also uh, answer the questions in the chat directly during the webinar, as well as if there are questions unresolved, of course, we can also um, write you an email afterwards. So yeah, quick introduction about Transcribus and who is behind Transcribus. So first, what is Transcribus? Yeah, since you are here, you probably already know at least the name, what is Transcribus? And we also have a yeah little definition to kind of keep in mind who or what is Transcribus. We call it a little AI powered alley um, who is designed to simplify the time consuming uh, work with historical documents to kind of give you the tools that make working with those documents fun. Um, then a quick look on who is behind Transcribus. Transcribus is owned by a cooperative, which is basically a European cooperative based in Innsbruck, Austria. We are more than 100 members who basically co-own this cooperative. Everybody can take part, also private members. We have a lot of private members that also share uh, have, or hold a little share in Transcribus. So basically it's open to everyone. You can become a part of Transcribus as well as a co-owner of Transcribus by joining the co cooperative. And obviously there's also a lot of institutions, universities, archives, national archives, and other institutions that work um, with as memory institutions with Transcribus. But there's more to it. There's a whole community behind Transcribus. There's now about 160,000 users worldwide that are already using Transcribus. Here you can see a nice image of the Transcribus user conference last year. Last year in September, we had the user conference. There will be another one in February in Innsbruck again. And it's a really nice event where, you, where we kind of try together with all our users and we will have it in person in Innsbruck, but also online, it's a hybrid conference. And it's a really nice opportunity to connect, to connect and talk about Transcribus. Then a quick look at the ecosystem. So what is Transcribus uh, in general? We understand Transcribus more than a simple platform. Transcribus already has become an ecosystem with basically three major components. If you're kind of working with historical material, there's a whole chain of things that you need to do in order to make those uh, valuable sources available. In terms of ecosystem or the Transcribus ecosystem, we basically have something in the very beginning. Once you try to start with, or once you start with those historical document, then do documents, you obviously need to digitize them first. Um, what we have come up with is basically a portable scanning solution called the scan tent, which is basically a little tent that you can set up to scan with your smartphone. It's a controlled lighting, lighting situation that you can put in your material and scan with your smartphone. There's also an app it comes with. It's called the DocScan app. 
which kind of recognizes automatically if you're kind of turning pages, then the next page image is automatically taken. And then obviously there's the biggest part of the Transcribus ecosystem, which is the Transcribus platform, which has also a lot of different functions. On the one hand, you can manually transcribe, collect data, annotate, but most importantly, you can train your own custom AI models with Transcribus and then use those AI models for AI-based recognition. There are four different types of AI models um, as of now that you can train with Transcribus. There used to be text recognition model on, models only, but yeah, we have just recently introduced two more model types, which I will explain um, in more detail later on, which are called field and table models. And then there's also the field model uh, that you can train, uh, the, the line model that you can train basically for the text lines to recognize. And then eventually there's also transcriber sites, which we are uh, launching in December. It's already available on beta, which is basically a solution to give you the opportunity to share your transcribus collection with the world. So basically set up your own website where you can make your historical material searchable and available to everyone. But what does transcribus make possible? So first, as you know, transcribus, the most important uh, component of transcribus is the manual, but also automatic transcription of handwriting, handwriting and printed text. So that's, that's the key functionality that most of you might already know in terms of using Transcribus. You can use already available AI models, but also your own custom-made AI models to transcribe text. Yeah, as I said, training is the other key component when it comes to recognition. There is also collaboration features. You can share your collections and work together in those collections. That's a great opportunity for crowdsourcing projects, for instance. And then obviously, since you can recognize the full text of your material, you can obviously also search in your uh, documents with Transcribus. Then there's also tagging, so annotation. You can enrich your material with Transcribus, annotate the material with metadata and structure, also annotate the structure of your uh, documents. And then eventually there's also uh, yeah, almost plethora of uh, export formats that you can export with Transcribus to kind of get your material out of Transcribus again and use it for whatever you like. And now I would like to hand over to my colleague Helene, who will walk you through the uh, Transcribus next generation. So basically the new Transcribus web app, which is now live for about one and a half months. Yeah. Thank you, exactly. Helene. Thank you, Flo. Um, yeah, so as Flo mentioned, Transcribus switched to the Transcribus web app a few months ago. And the new app combines basically the features of the expert client, many different functions a with a new uh, easy to use interface. So the expert client, sorry? It just had a short the freeze, expert... just go ahead. Um, the expert client on the left combines and or has many different features, but is difficult to use, um, especially for beginners, because of the complex interface. The new web-based Transcribus platform has a clear design that is easy to use and also easier to learn. And we now have a platform that is user-friendly and easy to navigate. For the web app, no download is required. You can simply log in from anywhere with your personal access and account data to work on your document. The important functions of the expert client are still added step-by-step -step to the web app, but the new functions will be only available in the web app. You can find it uh, on the link by the link that we have here on the slide on app.transcribus.eu. It is available in 12 languages and data protection is very important to us and all data is stored on our own servers in Innsbruck in Austria. In the new web interface, we have four main workspaces, which you can also see here. And the approach here is, as with the Transcribus app in general, a quite holistic approach. So the first workspace is the Transcribus desk. This is where the work is done, where the documents are uploaded, sorted into collections, and the pages are transcribed and searched. So here from the desk, you have access to the documents and, of course, also access to the other workspaces. 
The second workspace is the model workspace. And this is where the transcribus magic takes place. This is where the models are trained and managed. We can take a closer look later, but we have really redesigned this workspace. This is the area where there is an overview over the public models and also your personal custom models. Then what's new, what Flo also already mentioned is Transcribus Sites. There's the third main workspace. You can think of it as a content management system where you can publish your material simply and easily like a website. And of course, you can also personalize this website with your colors, with your images, and in this way, share your work and your transcribed documents with the public. Um, but we will talk about uh, that more later. We have also something excited planned for next year that is Transcribus Connect that we've also already teasered. We recently cracked the one, 150,000 user mark and we want to give our users a better opportunity to network with each other and Transcribus will be a better way to connect with like-minded people. So now that we have looked at uh, why the switch to the Transcribus app was made, and how we restructured the platform, we will now take a closer look at the basics and I will explain the basic. Kibos manages to go from image to machine readable text. This makes it easier to work with historical documents and their content. So how does this work? If we move to the next slide, we can see that Transcribus uses HTR, which means handwritten text recognition. And the HTR technology can transform images of handwriting or printed text into text that is readable and searchable. And this text we can then also export in various formats. In the field of automatic text recognition, however, there is not only HTR, but also OCR. So we have handwritten text recognition and optical character recognition. In principle, both of these methods transform images or text into machine readable text, but there are some important differences that we have to differentiate. So OCR can only transcribe printed or typed text and HTR can transcribe typewritten printed as well as handwritten text. There is also a difference in the way that these technologies work. So while OCR focuses on single characters, HTR can process the entire line. And one major benefit of HTR is that it is possible to train a custom AI model that can work specifically with the handwriting style or the printed text that you have. So you can really customize it. So what happens when a page is recognized? And so what happens when we use this HDR technology of Transcribus? When we start a text recognition, there are actually two steps, even if we click on just one button. The first is the layout recognition that recognizes the lines and the text regions. And then the second step is the actual text recognition. So that an image can be transcribed correctly, first the layout is analyzed and the documents are segmented into text regions and into lines, as we can see on the next slide. You can see on the left side that the text region is a box that encloses all the handwritten text contained in the image. And the baseline on the right is the most important reference point for text recognition. This is a polyline that runs along the bottom of the handwritten line of text. This is really important to understand that Transcribus or the text, recogn text recognition model knows where the text is and where the lines are and can recognize the text correctly. If you run the documents through the standard text recognition, then both layout and text recognition happen. However, as we can see on the next slide, they can also select text recognition and layout recognition as two separate recognition steps. And this can be very useful and helpful, especially when you have a complex layout, for example. So now that we have seen how this actually works, how the text recognition process works. I would like to explain first how the documents are managed in the Transcribus platform. 
So what we have here and how it works is basically that the first step in our content management system is that you have collections. These are folders in which documents are stored. Usually one collection is a project and each collection has a name and an ID. In the collection, you can find the documents and here you can upload as many documents as you would like. Uh, at this point, it is also important to say that the Transcribus content management system has no subfolders, but collections and documents. Within these documents then are the images. So these images are pictures of the pages of the respective documents. So one document can contain one page, for example, if it's a letter, but if it's a book, it can also contain hundreds of pages, for example. So it is important to understand the structure, how pages, documents, and collections or project are organized so that you can plan and structure your own work um, most efficiently. We also have new options for managing documents. It is now possible to create shortcuts to other collections. When you create a shortcut, the document stays in the main collection, but it also appears linked in other collections and can be accessed from there. The documents can also be moved, copied and deleted. If you delete a document by mistake, you can still go into the recycle bin and you can either restore the document if it was an accident, or you can also delete them permanently from there. So now I think we'll take a closer look on how managing the document looks in the Transcribus app itself. You can take a look alongside us. Uh, you can go again to app.transcribus.eu, as you can also see here, and log in with your account details. So in the Transcribus web app, this is the landing page. This is home in the Transcribus desk workspace. As you can see in the top right side, we're now in a desk workspace. In home, you can see your collection and your recent collections and your recent documents. If you then move to collections, which is just right beside home, you can see your personal collections or the collections other Transcribus users have shared with you. You can also switch the view from thumbnail um, and you can also edit Exactly here, we can see the table view now. You can also edit the information of your collection by clicking on the three dots in the right corner. Of course, in collections, you can also add a new collection, as you can see here. When you open the collection, you will see the documents inside. Here you can see the thumbnails of the documents, and this is also where you can manage your documents. You can sort your documents by alphabetical order or how new they are. And exactly, so newest to first, oldest to first, depending on how you prefer to have your documents sorted and shown. Again, you can also switch from table view to thumbnail view. Here, you can also edit the metadata of your documents. And you can do that by clicking on edit and you can add the author, writer, genre, languages. You don't have to add the metadata, but it can be quite useful to have that information on hand if you'd like. In documents, you can also create shortcuts. This is what I've mentioned before shortly. Again, they're basically a soft link to another collection where you have a shortcut to the document from another collection, but the document will stay in this main collection. When you open a document, you can see the images of the pages. Here we see them again in a thumbnail view, which of course you can also change. Here you can also adjust the size, for example, of the thumbnails. You can make them larger or smaller. And one nice thing here is that you can also filter them by, by status. So you can see the different status in progress or done. And this is also indicated by the colors of the documents. So what the status basically is, is what it, that it shows you at what point the transcription process is. 
So gray documents indicate, for example, newly uploaded documents. Orange means that transcription is in progress. Done means that the transcription is finished. And ground truth, which is then a dark green, is that the transcription is correct. And you can also use these pages to train a model, but my colleagues will explain more about that later. We can also have a quick look at how it looks when we open a page or an image. This is the transcribus editor. On the left side, we have the layout editor with the image itself. You can also um, edit this one. We have where you can find shortcuts to edit it on the right side is exactly here. We have the guide for the shortcuts. And on the right side of the transcribus editor, we have the text editor. Here is the text, the recognized text here. You can also write the transcriptions yourself and edit the transcription. And there's also the option to, exactly, we can see my, my colleague is showing how to um, add transcription. And uh, we will have a closer look at that later on again, I think. So we have looked at the structure of transcribus, where to find the collections and where to find the pages. And now let's take a closer look at how you can upload and work with your own documents. The process of uploading and recognizing takes place again in the desk workspace. This is where the work happens. And what we'll explain here is how we get from the image itself from the uploaded image to machine readable text. The first step in this workflow is to upload the document. After that, we check whether there is a suitable model, a suitable public model that already exists um, for the scripts or the language that we're working in. If there is no suitable model or if the public model doesn't work well, you can train your own custom model. If there is a suitable model, you can simply use it depending on the extent of the material. Uh, it might take a while for the actual transcription process. And we have now, we will now take a closer look on how that looks. So assuming that we have a suitable model, what happens next? Again, we have to upload a document. To do this, you can either go into the collection, create, a new collection. And then you see directly that you can upload documents, either browse or drag and drop them inside the file upload. You can give them a name if you want, and then click on submit to submit the pages. So the upload is in process. We can see this takes a bit. We have a few pages, but it is quite fast. And when we have uploaded the documents, we are able to start the text recognition process with a public model. And we will take a closer look at how this looks now. We have an overview of the job in the job queue. So we are seeing that the document is created, that it is running already finished. And you have also an overview of the, there we go. So what we can do now uh, is select the pages that you want recognized. And you click on recognize. This will open a new window. We have already a total of over as we can see, over 150, 160 public models available, ranging from German Kuran to Carolingian Minuscule or Ottoman Turkish even. And you can then filter these public models by language, for example. Also, we have here the language is, is English for the document that we have. So we can select an English model or filter by English model. You can also select if it's handwritten or printed and the time frame on the left side. Then you can see that the documents uh, that sorry that the models, the public models that are available are shown. And if you click on a model, you also see further information on the right side. So let's take a look at the English Eagle, for example. You can see more information 
about what language is it what, what language it is the training set size and also the CER the character error rate the character error rate shows the percentage of characters that were transcribed incorrectly by the text uh, recognition model. So for example, let's say with an error rate of 5%, that means compared to the manual transcription, so the, the correctly transcribed pages, five out of 100 characters were incorrectly transcribed. With um, If you want to make the model more reliance or in, increase the performance of the model, as it depends on a few factors, um, for example, also the training material that the model is trained on, or example, the performance with the character error rate, um, you can increase the result by clicking on, for example, language model. And language model means that not only the visual text is taken into account, but also the language in which the text is written. Then you can click on start text recognition to start the recognition process. Again, you can check the status in the jobs queue and see where um, how long it might take. Recognizing the pages might take a bit of time depending on the size of material. Um, once it's done, you can just open or reload the page and then you should be able to see the transcription. Um, we have looked at the editor before, so we have the left side of the editor with the image and on the right side, then the transcription should appear. It's already running. So very nice. Depending on the amount of pages, you're also faster in a lane. Smaller drops below five pages, for instance, or fast lanes, fast lane. So you don't Maybe need in the to meantime, wait too we long. can take a look at, ah, perfect. Should we take a look at the supermodels in the meantime? Yeah. Perfect. So one new technology that we have are supermodels. And what is new and impressive about them is that they are very large and generally very versatile models. So this means that you can use one model for different scripts and different languages and also for mixed material. So usually you have to really look at what language the model is used for, what material the model is used for, and then find a public model that is as close to your material as possible. But the great thing about our supermodels is that they are very versatile in use. The first supermodel is already available. We have the text Titan and it has been trained in six languages. And as you saw, you can already select it. I start. Uh, sorry, I just started the recognition so we can maybe then compare the results from the. Oh, that's, and the a, that's the a good words. idea. Yeah, thank you. So it's running in the meantime. Perfect. So I think we've covered now the basics of how to upload the documents, how to use a public text recognition model. Maybe we can see the results of the um, recognition. So again, here you see on the left side, the image in the layout editor. On the right side, you have the transcription. Some things need to be corrected um, and edited, but the basic workflow I think um, has been shown and, and also the results you can see quite well how it technically should work. Yeah, so up here you can always see with which model you recognized it, but probably the other recognition is still running. Maybe we come back later. Maybe we can come back later. To to see uh, with the text tight and there's a longer queue. So it will take a little longer until that page is processed. All right. All right, so I think now we've gone through a lot of information about how the new web app is structured, where you can find your documents, your collections, and how to use public text recognition models. And I will now hand over to my colleague, Sarah. And I think Sarah will now explain how you can work with the Transcribus editor. In the meantime, just a little comment. We have more slides prepared. We will share them with you. So everything that we had a look at now is also in the slides. So I will just briefly go through them and then you can also have the slides afterwards. And now our colleague Sarah will continue. Thank you, Flo. Thank you, Helena. Okay, now we will have a look uh, at uh, how to enhance our transcription, uh, our automatic uh, or manual transcription within uh, Transcribus, uh, and how to work with the editor and add uh, 
both structural and uh, uh, textual tags. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we have done our text recognition. So now we want to uh, move uh, to tagging part. Uh, you don't have uh, to tag the documents uh, if you don't need to, but this uh, is a feature that you can uh, use if you want to enrich uh, your transcriptions and then export the tags uh, in various formats. For instance, you can export uh, uh, a, an Excel sheet uh, with all the tags, uh, you can add properties to the tags, uh, and uh, you can also export uh, a TI file uh, with all the tags uh, in it. Um, we can have a look inside Transcribus, so I can show you directly within uh, the platform. So there are two different uh, types uh, of uh, tags. Uh, I would just choose another collection, if it works. Uh, yes, so the first type uh, is uh, the structural uh, tag, and uh, we use that uh, mainly to uh, um, highlight a part uh, of the uh, of the image and add the tags there. So you see here, this uh, is uh, uh, a page. So let's uh, we can delete this text region and start from scratch. Here at the top, uh, we have uh, this decoration. I can add uh, a text region there. And I can do the same uh, for uh, the, the title, uh, different, uh, the, the, the um, capital letter here, and then uh, the different uh, paragraphs. Uh. After that, we can assign structural tags, like here. We have the tag uh, paragraph, uh, the tag uh, initial here. And uh, here we can add uh, the tag uh, uh, heading or title and so on. And we can also customize uh, the tags uh, um, here. Uh, I don't see it uh, in the screen because uh, it's... Uh, Help me yes, here. thank you. Here under tags, uh, you can decide uh, which tags you want to see, and uh, you can also customize them. So add tags uh, um, based on the type of documents uh, that uh, you are using. So now um, flow enable more tags, uh, and when you refresh the page, uh, you will see them uh, here uh, between the options. So... Oh no, they are already there. So you can add the uh, another tag uh, here. And uh, how these uh, tags uh, are useful. Uh, um, the first uh, option uh, is uh, because you want to um, apply in this way, you can uh, apply different uh, uh, recognition models uh, to different uh, regions uh, of your page. So let's imagine that uh, you have a uh, uh, a printed text uh, with some unwritten marginalia. You can tag uh, the unwritten marginalia as a uh, manuscript and tag the, the main text uh, as uh, printed paragraphs. And then uh, you can uh, uh, apply different uh, uh, models uh, to the different uh, uh, sections of the, the image. Or you can also use it uh, to export uh, information about uh, your, uh, your document or for information extraction. Because, uh, we will see later with uh, uh, Flow. Uh -huh. May I just quickly show something? Because there's yes. a question which is not perfectly intuitive, how to use the region tool. So if you kind of click and then try to draw the region, the page is moving. We will change that with the new editor that will be released soon. But to draw regions, just click once and then you can pull the region open. So that's maybe not perfectly intuitive, but you need to click first once to set the first uh, corner point and then you open the region because that question was in the in the chat. And sorry, Sarah, then you can continue. No, no problem. And um, then you can also export uh, with a new um, uh, export feature that we will introduce, you will also be able to 
export uh, the information uh, in a structural way. So you will have the tag and uh, the in an Excel, the tag and the, the text contained in that tag. So especially for information extraction, this is very helpful. And uh, now we also have a feature to train a, a fields model. But Flo will explain that uh, later, but just to show you an example uh, here. In this index card, uh, for instance, you can tag uh, the different information uh, with different structural tags uh, and train a model to do that for you, as Flo will show us later. The second uh, type of tag uh, is, uh, are the textual tags. Uh, so tags, uh, you tag uh, the, the text, uh, not the structure. So we are here. This uh, is a, a Word diary. Um, and you see, I have the automatic transcription, and I can uh, tag uh, the text uh, here. There are different, uh, uh, there are a predefined set of tags, uh, like uh, uh, if I click here, you see the abbreviation, date, and person tag appears, but we can also configure the tags uh, and enable the place tag. And we have to click save. Or you can also customize the tags uh, to your needs and also add properties to tags. Uh, in this case, uh, we have the York station. We select uh, the tag. We click. Uh, we select uh, the words. Uh, we click uh, place, uh, and you see I can uh, write. Uh, uh, I can write uh, the place uh, York. Or there's also this uh, uh, nice feature where you can directly select uh, the wiki data ID. So in this case, uh, automatically transcribes uh, propose me the York Railway Station. It's correct in this way. So I can select the, the wiki at that ID link to this place, or you can just type uh, York uh, Railway Station and see the, uh, the other options. And as it, you can see here, Wikidata propose you the, the ID here, and you can do the same for uh, uh, dates or uh, mm, persons that have a, a Wikidata uh, ID. And for example, here, Friday, March 16, we can tag a day, add the date uh, and uh, write it uh, here below. Uh, and in this way, the text, uh, uh, now the tags uh, are saved uh, and uh, we can search tags uh, and at the same time export them uh, in various formats, uh, uh, like uh, as a, a list uh, of tags uh, or uh, um, as an XML. Good, say that I would uh, go to sort this, how to search uh, within Transcribus. Uh. So the search bar here is here at the top. Uh, you can uh, search uh, text uh, across all the collections, uh, or you can search uh, within uh, uh, the current uh, document. I want to search the word uh, piece. And here I have uh, the results. And if I click uh, on one of them, uh, I'm directed uh, to the page. Yeah, it's taking a bit. You know, I think this we found uh, a bug probably because it's not showing or <laughs> the Zoom screen is acting quite uh, or it might be Strange. related to Zoom, like yeah. with the sh screen sharing, there is some. Yeah, you should, we should be redirected uh, not to the old page, but to the page with uh, the uh, uh, with the result. And yeah. this uh, is a. Uh, um, so let's do it uh, again. Yeah. 
you can then filter your results uh, by uh, author, uploader, title, and collection ID. Um, and in this case, the author are uh, uh, and the title are data um, stored in the metadata, while the uploader is who uploaded the, the document and the collection ID if you want to limit uh, this search uh, on a specific collection. And also here, you can limit uh, the search uh, in the documents. Like this is the document I want to look at. Uh, yeah, you see here the result. Uh, even if the text is, is different, uh, but uh, it's problem with Zoom, I think. Uh, you see the result here, and you should see also the correct transcription here on the on the right uh, side. This uh, is uh, an option that you can also enable the um, you can also enable the FTSE search uh, to search uh, similar words uh, a word that differs by one or two characters. And uh, it's also possible to enable an advanced searching tool called Smart Search. To work with Smart Search, you need to enable it during the text recognition. So when Helena show us how to start the text recognition, there is a small box called Smart Search. With a Smart Smart Search is an advanced tool because it saw all the uh, possible alternatives uh, that uh, the that the trans the transcribers uh, uh, um, do that the transcribers guess so uh, what you see in the text recognition is just uh, the um the the word that transcribers think is more probable to be correct but in reality transcribers does a lot of guesses and uh, with smart search, uh, you can also go through all these those uh, guesses. Uh, and sometimes, especially if the Carter rate uh, is high, you can find you can still be able to find uh, the correct word. Uh, so the word that uh, you are searching, uh, even if the transcription is uh, is wrong uh, or is not one hundred percent correct. Do you want to add something, Phil? Oh, I think that's okay. fine. Yeah, quite handy tool. Um, and then the export features. Uh, if first to you can export an entire document. So you go here and you can select uh, then all uh, the entire document. Or you can do it inside the document and select just a few pages. And when you're here, you click the three dots here and you click uh, export. And there are different uh, type of export, and we will improve them uh, in the, the next month. So the standard export. Uh, uh, for now, we have standard export, uh, PDF export, and doc document. With the standard export, you get uh, uh, the images uh, and uh, the doc files, uh, transcribers PDF, and the page XML. And it's also possible to export uh, the alt Excel XML. In this way, uh, with both with page uh, and alto, you get an XML file for each page, uh, and you get not only the um, the text, uh, but also all the coordinates uh, of the points. Uh, so the coordinates of the text regions and the lines, uh, as well as the text. Uh, so this is uh, um, what you get from there. And then uh, with the PDF uh, document, uh, you can uh, um, select more options. Uh, you can have the image plus the text layer. Um, with this option, uh, you get a sort of a searchable PDF. Uh, so you have, you have you get uh, the image uh, um, is what you see, but then uh, beyond the image, uh, there is uh, the transcribe text. Uh, and in this way, the, the PDF becomes searchable, or you can uh, export uh, also the images only with the text uh, as uh, an extra text page. So one, one page is the image and the second page is the transcription. With the image plus, plus text layer, it's also possible to highlight tags. So you will uh, have uh, the image, but uh, the words, the tagged words, will be highlighted uh, in the PDF. And uh, finally, the document uh, here. This is a simple Word document, uh, and you can decide uh, if you want to have it as a continuous test text, or if you want to preserve uh, the line breaks, uh, 
forced the page, page breaks uh, mark uh, unclear words. Uh, so if you have tagged the words uh, as uh, unclear, you can uh, uh, export that as well and uh, write uh, an image name before the text. Then there are the advanced settings. Uh, these are uh, uh, really handy if you are working uh, with uh, abbreviations uh, and uh, especially early modern text. Uh, because uh, in Transcribus, uh, you can add a tag for the abbreviations and write uh, the expansion as a property of the tag. So as I showed you before, in the case of a date, uh, the property was uh, when the event happened, but there is also the property expansion for the abbreviation tag. And uh, with the word export, uh, you can decide uh, if you want to keep the abbreviations, uh, expand the abbreviations, uh, or in uh, brackets uh, or substitute the abbreviations. Uh, so you can have uh, a, because we know with abbreviations, uh, the uh, searchability of the text is limited, uh, but uh, if you substitute them uh, in your Word document, uh, you end up with a completely searchable text. When you select the, your feature, you have to start the exporting, the button is here, here below, uh, and you would receive a, a an email with a link, uh, and from that you can download uh, the export, but you will also see the job uh, in the job uh, uh, table right here. So here you will see that uh, the export job starts and you can also um, download uh, your documents uh, uh, from the export document from there. Yeah, and about the upcoming uh, export feature that uh, we will introduce uh, in the next Coming month, months, uh, we will have uh, um, the possibility to export uh, uh, tables uh, in uh, the expo in into Excel. Uh, so you can uh, uh, flow will show us how to train tables. Uh, so it's possible to do all within Transcribus. You can train uh, the recognition of table, then do the text recognition for the text instead of the table, and then export uh, the table. Uh, in an Excel sheet, because it's not just important the text, but also the position of the text in a table. And then we will have the TI format, so the text including initiative. Uh, um, this is more important for digital humanities uh, and uh, um, digital editions. And we also improve the, um, improve the option to export uh, tags uh, as uh, uh, an Excel sheet. So you can export uh, all the places that you had tagged inside a collection and work on them. Good, I will go back to the presentation to talk about uh, uh, training. Here again, the slides will link over all these topics that Sarah has just covered, covered regarding export and searching. And now let's come to the fun part. Yes, we now move uh, to the models uh, uh, tab, so where the magic happens, where you can uh, train uh, your own models, uh, you don't need to uh, know how to co code, you, there is a friendly interface that guides you to training, to train uh, AI models. So. Uh, but before uh, showing you how to train models, uh, uh, let's uh, have a quick uh, introduction to uh, what uh, artificial intelligence uh, and uh, machine learning are. So next slide. Yeah, here are the four types uh, of models available. So we will just do now an introduction about uh, training models. Uh, and then we will show you the different type of mod trainable models. So there are text recognition models, uh, baseline models, fields models, and table models. So, so when we talk about artificial intelligence, it is a set of technology and techniques that allow machines uh, to perform tasks that require human intelligence. In the case uh, of uh, Transcribus, uh, we are working with uh, machine learning, uh, which is uh, a subfield of uh, artificial intelligence. It provides uh, machines with the ability to automatically learn uh, from data while identify patterns to make prediction with minimal human intervention. In our case, so our machine learning wor works with both label and uh, unlabeled data. In our case, uh, we are talking about labeled data. So we need to provide uh, uh, the machine transcribus uh, with uh, data 
that uh, is labeled by humans. In our case, the data is the images and the transcriptions or the images and the layout elements in the case of fields and tables models. And only when we have this data, we can train the machine to learn from it. And then we can apply it on new pages. Um, you have heard Helene talking about uh, models, uh, but what models uh, are? Uh, AI models are algorithms creating during the training process of a machine learning system. They are the output of the training process, embodying the knowledge acquired. So after the training pro process, after the training, we end up uh, with uh, a model. Uh, the process is the same for the public models uh, and for the models that you are going to train. Uh, um, and what the, the machine uh, has learned uh, during the training ends up uh, in the, the model. And then you can apply the model on new pages. Uh, it's also important uh, uh, to understand uh, uh, how the pages uh, are used during the training. The next slide. Okay. There is this term uh, that we use in transcripts and comes from uh, machine learning. It's a ground root. Uh, it seems a very strange term, uh, but in in a few words, uh, the ground truth is the label data on which the model is trained. So in our case, uh, when we say we have to create ground truth, uh, it means that uh, we have to transcribe uh, some pages. Uh, so it depends on the material, but at least uh, 50 pages, uh, we have to manually transcribe in them. Uh, um, we have to manually transcribe them uh, or uh, copy and paste a transcription from outside transcribers into the platform. And when we have this correct transcription, this ground truth, because we save it uh, with the term ground truth, we can start the training. And uh, when we have our pages of ground truth, around 90% of those pages uh, are assigned to the training set, uh, and 10% uh, is assigned to the validation set. The training set uh, is uh, the actual pages uh, on which the model uh, is trained. So the model learn uh, on those pages uh, but then 10% of the pages uh, is set aside uh, and it's called validation set and the model uses this, those pages uh, to test its accuracy. So you need to, you need to, not to uh, spare effort uh, on the validation set uh, but because it's quite important uh, uh, to have a good validation set to, to test the accuracy of the model. Otherwise you could end up with a very good or, or very bad uh, Carter error rate, but which is not realistic because it's not based on a good validation set. So the model doesn't have the chance to doesn't have the chance to test its real accuracy if the validation set uh, has some bias. So now we will have a look inside the transcribers on how to train models. Yes, we are now in the this, this second part. Uh, so we want to train uh, our model uh, because there is no public model uh, available or we are not happy with the results of the public model. This could also be another uh, option. And we have first to start with the layout recognition, then with the creation of the ground truth pages. And after that, uh, we can uh, do the text recognition. First, uh, Okay, thank you, Flo. First, uh, we have to uh, select uh, our ground truth. As I say, for unwritten documents, uh, 50 pages uh, is uh, the minimum to start. Uh, what you can, there are, and it's all, also important to have a representative sample of the materials that you want to process. So if you want to train a model on the, on the, Two different, three different hands. Uh, so you want a model that is capable to read three different hands. It's important to include uh, all those hands, all the three hands uh, in your ground root. Uh, the same if you want a model that can uh, uh, read uh, different languages, uh, uh, you have to include examples of different languages, of example of different uh, scripts uh, in the ground root, uh, because the model will learn uh, uh, from what you show it. Uh, so. Mm, we have our ground truth, we have uploaded our images, uh, and now you can proceed uh, in two ways. Uh, the first uh, is uh, to do all the work uh, by, uh, by hand. So we are here. 
this is a, a new page. As you see, it's not possible to, to type the transcription here. Uh, there is uh, no line. Uh, um, if I try to type something on my keyboard, nothing happens. This uh, is because we need uh, first uh, to start uh, the layout recognition, uh, because as Helene told us before, uh, uh, Transcribus works uh, with uh, regions uh, and uh, lines. Uh, so the recognition happens at the line level, but also the training happens at the line level. Uh, so we need first uh, to run uh, the layout recognition. Uh, no, I don't see it uh, in my... Screen. Can you click below? Is it working? Below? Yeah, sure. Like here below, we have the recognition button, and then you can choose between text and layout. Yes. Now we want to run the layout recognition. Public models, we can select this model. And usually it is done automatically when you start the text recognition, but if you want to clear the ground root, you have to do it manually. And you don't need to do it for um, every page at once, you can start the text the layout recognition for the entire collection or the the whole document. So now we have to wait uh, a few seconds, uh, and after that, uh, we will see here um, the number of the lines, uh, as you see here. And here you can decide uh, maybe, maybe if... if I just may quickly interrupt if you. There was one question. If you want to reorder those lines, if the order is mm -hmm. not correct, and you say want to say that this is the first line, that's the second one. You can reorder the lines here on the left. Select the lines, and once you click on the line, it's always also highlighted. For instance, you see, you can say that's actually line one, and now you have changed the order of the lines. Sorry. Yes, exactly. No, no problem. Um, so here you can decide. Uh, what you want to transcribe, for instance, for me, these two uh, notes, uh, this the page number is not uh, important, so I can just leave uh, this line uh, um, blank, or I can delete the line. So you select the line, and then you click the accounts on your keyboard, and the same here. And when you're here, we start uh, the transcription. Now. Here you see there's there is a um, um, but the, for the punctuations uh, you can decide uh, how you want to treat them. Uh, usually we recommend uh, to follow what is written uh, in uh, the the document, uh, but the model also learns uh, to if there is enough ground truth, uh, the model also learns uh, to uh, normalize uh, punctuation or. Uh, uh, uppercase and lowercase letters. So we go on with the transcription. And if some is if some words are not clear, what you can do is to tag the word as unclear. Or if there is a damage in the document, you can tag um, you can use the tag gap. So it's here, the tag gap. And why it's important to note the unclear words because during the training, we can decide to exclude them from the training. What you have to have in mind, however, is that if you use this unclear or gap tag, not just uh, the Boston word uh, we will be excluded from the training, but the entire line. Uh, so Boston, December 29, uh, 8061. The entire line won't be considered within the training because the training happens at the line level. Uh, the second, so this is one approach. Uh, well, let's stay here. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, and when you have finished all the transcription uh, and you're sure about it, uh, you can save uh, the transcription as a ground route. If you are working uh, with uh, collaborators, colleagues, volunteers, uh, students, uh, and you ask them uh, to create a ground route for you, it could be useful to ask them to save the page as uh, done. So after that, uh, you can have 
a double check on transcription, be sure that uh, all the guidelines, your guidelines uh, are followed and then save it as ground router. Because it's very important to be consistent when you create a ground router. For example, here you should decide uh, quantum, uh, uh, how you want to render it. Uh, do you want uh, to underline it uh, or not? Uh, or uh, when there is this uh, dash on the end of the words, do you want to keep it uh, or not? And things like that. So um, to get a good result, uh, it's better to be consistent in those choices, especially if you're working with uh, medieval or early modern documents. Yeah, the second option- Here, for instance, you can then also set prescription guidelines for yourself that you can then consistently work on that. Yes. And uh, about uh, abbreviations, uh, as I show you, you can uh, uh, write the abbreviated form in the text, uh, tag them, uh, and uh, add uh, uh, the property as uh, the expansion as a property. And you can train transcribus to tag abbreviation for you uh, during afterwards. Uh, or another option is uh, to solve the abbreviations and by a certain extent, uh, um, the model learns uh, to solve the abbreviation, especially if they are very frequent in the ground route. Uh, so here, it mostly depends on the, uh, the goals of your project. Uh, so if you want a diplomatic transcription, you, have to, you can keep the abbreviation and write them as a, a, a tag them. If you want a searchable text, uh, like in, in the case, uh, in this case, uh, you, probably you want to have December as a searchable word, uh, you can uh, just write December. And uh, if you do it consistently in your ground route, uh, the model will learn uh, to do it itself. The second approach uh, is not to do all the transcription manually, but it's to start the recognition with uh, uh, a public model. Correct the, the recognition, so we can start the recognition on this page, uh, I think. To text titan or the English eagle should be fine. Thank you, Flo. Um, and when the recognition uh, is, uh, is finished, you can uh, um, correct the recognition uh, and uh, base uh, on that uh, train uh, your model. Usually this approach uh, saves you time if there is uh, a very good uh, model already available. If not, probably it's uh, it's better to do all from uh, from scratch. Or you can also work in an iterative way. So you can uh, train uh, a first model on 50 pages, uh, then you get a certain uh, level of uh, accuracy, apply it uh, on other 50 pages, uh, and then uh, start, uh, um, and then uh, apply it on new pages, uh, create new ground root on that uh, and go on. Like uh, yeah, here, the first line are quite good. Uh, so yeah, we just have to uh, make some, yeah, here it's a four and here is a 23, I guess. Uh, then you have just to check the transcription. Uh, we can also underline uh, this word and the same uh, here. And you can check all. Yeah, here, for instance, you see here, there is an error. Uh, and when you have finished, you can save as well as a ground root. Okay, when you have uh, enough pages uh, of ground route, uh, we move uh, to the model training. So we are here and we want to train a new model, in this case, a text recognition model. Uh, you're first asked uh, to uh, select uh, the collection. So um, the, um, the ground route should be all in one collection, but this is not the problem because you can always create a shortcut. So if you have a Ground root scatter among different collections, you can create a shortcut uh, and have only one main collection with all your ground root. Um, we are here. And here you can select uh, if you want to uh, select as, as a ground root uh, 
the pages with the latest transcription uh, because you have saved the, the transcription as done uh, or uh, final or in progress, or if you want to, to have the possibility only to choose uh, your ground truth uh, pages. And here at this stage, so if I go there, for instance, here I don't have any ground truth page, so there's not no possibility to select this document. And uh, here I can select uh, all the documents in my collection, or I can select just one document or go inside the, the document and select only some pages. You see here, this uh, document starts from page uh, five uh, because uh, the pages from uh, one to four uh, um, are not saved as a uh, ground truth, uh, so I can select uh, them. Uh, but if I change uh, this option, uh, they should become selectable. As you see now, I have all the 41 pages uh, in my uh, in my document. Here we have selected the training data and the next step, uh, and you also see here the amount of uh, words, uh, 4,000 words. In this case, uh, it's uh, I should, before starting the training, I should increase uh, the number of words because in this case, uh, we recommend uh, for a single hand, a model train on a single hand uh, to have at least uh, 10,000 words uh, per hand uh, if it isn't written. If it is a printed document, uh, you can decrease the number to 5,000 words. The next option is to select uh, the validation data. As I told you, there is, uh, it's possible to automatically select it. So automatically a 10% of your validation set uh, is assigned. Um, I recommend to use the automatic validation uh, set uh, to be sure that uh, all the different kind of documents, all a variety of documents is included, uh, but you can also do it uh, manually. And then we go to the model setup. Here you write uh, uh, the, the name, the description, and here you can uh, add the details of, of your model. This is, uh, unless you do, you make uh, your model uh, uh, public, uh, the model is private. So this is just information for uh, yourself uh, to have a reference uh, when you go back, especially if you want to train different versions and if, if you're training different version of the same model to improve the character rate, uh, you can say train on those and those pages. Here you can, uh, add uh, an image uh, URL uh, to see a, a snippet uh, of the writing style here. You can select uh, the language uh, here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The centrism. And here, Below there are the advanced uh, settings. Uh, you can read uh, about uh, all of them uh, in our help center. So there is the link in the presentation. I won't go into more details here. I just want to show you here that it's possible to include uh, a base model. What does a base model? Uh, um, you can select a pre-existing model, so a public model or a model that you have trained uh, and use it uh, as a base uh, for your own model. Usually, a base model increase, increases the performance of your model, especially if you use a very general model trained on similar hands. So in our case, we, are, we, are, we have already seen that the English Eagle work very well on my documents. So it's quite perfect. So I can select this model, and I'm just going to um, refine this model on the specific script uh, on my documents. And the great advantage of the of uh, a base model is that also you, it can reduce the number of pages uh, that uh, and words that you need for the training. So with a base model, uh, 4,000 words, uh, it's probably not enough uh, to have a good model, but uh, you can go down to 8,000 words and you don't need uh, 10,000 words. And you go to next. Uh, 
uh, you see the, an overview and uh, you can start uh, the training. After you're starting the training, uh, you, always, you can have a look here. You can see here the training has been uh, created. Uh, and after that, you have just you just need uh, to wait uh, the training. Uh, it could take uh, to a couple of hours to some days, uh, and uh, it depends uh, on the material uh, you are working on. So on ma how many pages, uh, now I'm just going to cancel this work, on how many pages uh, you are uh, training, uh, um, how many ground truth pages uh, you have, uh, but also it depends on the traffic on the server. So how many trainings uh, uh, Transcribers has to deal with uh, in that uh, specific moment. But you will also receive uh, an email uh, afterwards uh, when the training is complete. Uh, so you don't need to uh, keep uh, Transcribers open. You can close Transcribers uh, and close your um, laptop because the work is uh, all done uh, in, uh, uh, in the servers uh, in Innsbruck. And afterwards, uh, after the training is completed, uh, you will go there uh, and you can go to private models uh, and you can see your model. Um, take a look at the character error rate uh, here, uh, and you can apply. Yeah. The character error rate is uh, important. Uh, so both the character error rate and uh, the learning curve you see here, it's important to understand uh, how the, the training uh, went uh, and the performance of your model. But uh, just don't look only at it uh, because uh, it's also important to uh, see the real uh, uh, application, see the real result uh, on a page. So sometimes uh, uh, it's not, uh, it's better to test uh, a model on a real page and, and just not looking at uh, the Carter error rate. Yeah, I think we can go back uh, to the slides uh, and just uh, have a look at how many pages uh, and words you need. Yes, here you have uh, an overview. So for printed text, uh, uh, 5,000 words of ground root are enough, and you can expect the character rate between 0.5 and 2%. Uh, for uh, a simple hand in a simple writing, uh, you need uh, uh, 10,000 words uh, per, uh, um, per in the, for, to train the model. Uh, and uh, you will get a character rate between two and 4%, uh, and then uh, the number of words uh, increase, uh, especially if you are including uh, more hands, uh, and or you want a model, very general model that can deal with multiple hands, uh, not seen, not all seen during the training. So you need, you would need uh, more than uh, 100,000 words, uh, and uh, the character rate increase to, to six to 8%, uh, because the model will be very, uh, good uh, on some hands, uh, but on others, uh, not seen as much uh, during the training, uh, the uh, the performance uh, will, um, could uh, decrease. Uh, but especially with super models, uh, we are trying to um, face this, uh, these problems uh, because super models are really good with uh, all new hands uh, not seen uh, during the training. Um, and the next slide is about uh, the base model, uh, so we can go on. And now we will talk about uh, the other types uh, of uh, uh, models. Uh, um, baseline models, uh, fields model, table models, refers uh, to the um, layout. So those are, uh, um, you don't need to train them uh, unless uh, you, the results uh, with the layout uh, are not good uh, as expected. So in the case of baseline model, uh, we are working with uh, uh, the recognition of uh, the lines. Uh, here you see there is the text region uh, in green uh, and the line, the baseline in uh, in blue. And the line needs to run uh, at the base uh, of, uh, of the letters. So sometimes uh, uh, the automatic uh, baseline detection, so the automatic layout recognition isn't good, especially if you are working with very complex layouts. Uh, uh, for instance, sometimes it happens with uh, newspapers, uh, uh, letters, uh, with uh, not only with horizontal text, but also with vertical text. And the uh, text uh, in, with mixed orientation is uh, um, a struggle sometimes for transcribers, uh, or you are working with uh, postcards uh, or strange uh, layouts. 
So what to do in this case? Um, next slide. Um, so if you're working with a complex layout, uh, the first uh, thing to do is not to train a baseline model as the first option, but uh, first uh, we recommend to try to use uh, a different uh, baseline public models. So by default, uh, the mixed line orientation model is selected, but sometimes uh, there, are, there are other public models that could be very good too. Uh, so our suggestion is uh, to use a different baseline model and you can do it also in combination uh, with uh, a different layout settings configurations. Uh, so this next slide, there are some uh, advanced settings that you can uh, uh, change. We are not going to uh, into detail into in, in this, but uh, just to let you know that uh, uh, often the problem is not the text recognition per se, but that is the layout recognition. So you can work on that. If the result of the text recognition is not good, the problem could be not just the model, but the, you, the problem is the layout recognition. So Transcribus isn't um, correctly looking at your lines. And you can tackle this problem by using a different baseline model or working with the advanced settings, often with a, uh, printed text, uh, or especially with the newspaper, just uh, finding the right configuration for uh, um, for those type of lines uh, and uh, helps, uh, helps a lot uh, and uh, solves a lot of problem. If you have tried all the settings and all the possible combination and nothing uh, works, uh, you can always uh, train uh, a baseline model specific for your documents. Um, so the next slide. So here you see this uh, uh, is an example. This is a, in, a sort of uh, index card. And uh, the problem here is uh, uh, that uh, it's, it's not detected correctly uh, some part of the text, uh, like the data or the, the sign uh, on the right. And at the same time, uh, it's also uh, detecting uh, some uh, um, text uh, that I don't want to have uh, in my transcription, like the the small line at the bottom with the name of the printer of this index card. And in my workflow, probably this will become just a rumor in my transcription. So what I can do in this case, and we can go to the next slide, is to train, to, do, to create the correct layout baselines, layout recognition, so I can manually fix it for at least 50 pages, and uh, I can uh, uh, create a layout the layout recognition that uh, I want. So in the case of the line, uh, I can create just one line uh, or uh, avoid uh, to create baselines for the details that I don't, I don't want to transcribe. This is also useful for tables. So if you have some information or if you don't want to have the data signs in your tables uh, or uh, some numbers, uh, you can just uh, avoid uh, to uh, you can just train a baseline model to avoid uh, those elements and when you have to prepare uh, at least 50 pages uh, of ground truth with the correct uh, uh, with the correct baselines uh, you can train uh, your model for that and just remember that you don't need to have the text uh, to train uh, a baseline model uh, what is important is just the, the layout and the training uh, works uh, in the same way uh, as for the uh, text recognition, and you can always find some information in the help center. And now I will leave the floor to Flo for the last part. Thanks a lot. Yeah, as you have probably seen, Sarah is very enthusiastic about this and also the expert in our team. So Sarah is the one who basically knows yeah, about the baseline. Of no, in general, uh, with in transcribers general, okay. and text models, like you know the most uh, settings and know how to use them best. So it's really good to have you here and share those insights with us. Yeah, now let's have a quick look at field and table models. I'll quickly go through them and then also address the questions in the Q&A uh, at the end, because there are some open questions and we will definitely talk about them. And um, we've he now heard a lot of, about text and lines, um, but what really is, a challenge still is kind of the structure of its historical documents. As you, you can see in this example, uh, historical documents 
yeah, used to be quite complex. And the writing in those documents also needs to be located to, ex to, to be extracted. Um, what we have now on our public beta version are field models. And as you've seen before with text regions, you can also tag them. And now what we have with the field models is a trainable model, basically, that you can train on your own on a beta version, where you can train a model to recognize recognize text regions with those labels as you have trained them, or as you have basically labeled them in your training data, and then uh, label more similar data with those field models. Mm -hmm. um, you can, as I said, automatically mark regions with labels and assign fractal text to those. There are about 50 pages of training data needed, which usually is, uh, yeah, quicker in terms of production than text training data because transcribing a page takes yeah, more time than drawing the text regions and designing labels. So here you're rather quick in producing training data and then can train your own model to recognize always, for instance, in this detail, the shelf mark, uh, the name, the newspaper and the details, less those fields in more material. And then afterwards you can extract that information and for instance, um, yeah, move it into a database or migrate it into other tools. Um, yeah, as I said, you can find those field models on our beta version. There's a guided process as Sarah has shown you with the text recognition that you can click through um, where you can add your training material and then set up your model training and eventually use your model. There are a number of different applications. There are historical documents where um, text regions are quite scattered and you kind of need to recognize them all. So instead of using a bottom-up approach, which is the standard layout recognition approach, where first the text lines recognized and then they are clustered into regions, you can basically also use a top-down approach where you first recognize the regions and label them as such and then add lines to those regions. You can also segment newspapers with the fields, field models. So uh, newspaper segmentation can be also done with that. You can segment forms, which are very common in historical material and extract those labels, for instance, as the place name or the first name or the last name or date, religion, um, yeah, you name it. Those fields can also be yeah. marked or in the structure of the document and then labeled with the field model in also different uh, formats. So depending on the training data size, you can train a model to handle a number of those formats, not just one single uh, layout, but also different layouts as layouts changed over time. You can train a field model to recognize more than one format as well. Then there's also multi-column layouts, which you want to maybe work with. Um, yeah, so there's basically, um, as this is, from a technical point of view, instance segmentation, unlimited possibilities. So you basically name the fields, you mark the field on your material, and then you train a model to recognize those fields. In theory, they also work for illustrations. So you, so you can basically, for now, there are only text regions, but we will introduce more layout regions soon. So you can mark an image. For now, it works with the text regions as well, as this is basically not bound to but just be used for a, for a text. You can also mark an illustration, an image, a page number um, in your material and then train the model to recognize those illustrations, um, illustrated manuscripts, for instance. You could, for instance, then extract all the illustrations in those illustrated manuscript or extract the initials. If you're working with the material, so you probably know the material better than I do, and then the second um, model type that we are introducing on our beta version are table models. It's a very similar technology that is used here, but it's uh, tailored to work with models. So you can train your own model to work in transcribables to recognize tables. And then eventually, as Sarah has already mentioned, with the, with the Excel exports or with the spreadsheet export, you can export those tables to an Excel sheet and then basically um, yeah, manipulate and work with that data as you like. We have some more information here on the slides. And just briefly to show you how that works. Basically, those models will recognize rows and columns and then match those rows and columns to come up with a table. 
So here in this example, for instance, first the rows are matched, uh, recognized, then the columns are recognized, and eventually they are matched, and you come, you end up with a table and can extract that data in a nicely um, structured way. Yeah, you can see it's also another example how those table, tables will look like. The tables can be also skewed, so they don't need to be perfectly straight. straight. So the table models are quite robust. And you can also train multi-line tables where multiple lines are in a cell and then basically extract that information like in the example shown here. In terms of uh, training data that is needed, you can even start with 20 pages. So for a simple ta uh, table, about 20 pages, as shown in this example, I've really tried it out with this particular document. There were about 20 pages in the training data that were sufficient. So very similar tables to this. You can easily train a table model with about 20 pages and then recognize yeah, an indefinite or an infinite amount of pages yeah, theoretically with that model. For more difficult tables, there's about yeah, 30 to 50 pages required. And if there is a mixture of, mixture of tables, then you might need more than 50 pages of training data. And again, that's also a guided process. It works similarly as with the text model, but you will find it on our beta instance and can check, can check it out on your own. Here's a little summary that you can then check out in the slides. And being mindful of the time, I will try to cover the remaining items. We are currently also in the move towards a new subscription system. As you know, Transcribos, basically everything that you have seen here, but text recognition is free to use. So you can use Transcribos for whatever you like. Only for the text recognition at the moment, you will need to pay also only for larger amounts. So with every account, you get 500 free credits for free. We will adapt that a little bit in, yeah, in, in the core principle, transcribers will remain free. We will even um, yeah, increase the amount of free credits that you will receive. We will change that from a one-time 500 package to a monthly 100 package. So you will get for free 100 credits, credits which equals basically 100 pages of text recognition every month. So if you're basically loyal user of Transcribus, you will get more out of it for free. All the features that you've seen will also be available, except for some advanced tools like the field and table models. They will then also uh, be charged uh, as credits. So once you use a field and table model, that will also then charge a credit. And also the new Transcribus sites functionality, which I will show in a second, will be um, paid then. But in theory, there's not too much that has changed. We will focus on the change to make Transcribus more sustainable. As we have addressed at the beginning, we are a cooperative and need to make sure that Transcribus can yeah. far, be further developed and also be continued and maintained. And for this, we are moving towards the subscription system, which will give Transcribus yeah, more security and a more long-term commitment also from the user base in terms of using Transcribus. There are uh, different, yeah, three different plans that will be available. I will show you in a second. Um, and eventually yeah, you can see them here. The whole community will benefit as we will introduce those plans to a set and further develop Transcribus. And the nice thing about being a cooperative is that every single dollar or euro that Transcribus makes will be reinvested. So there's basically no dividend payout. So we are acting like a nonprofit all uh, the returns that we are or all the revenue that is coming from the platform will be reinvested and basically just helps Transcribus grow and make the software better for everyone. Said there will be the individual plan where you get 100 free credits every month. Then there will be more advanced plans like the Scola plan starting from 1490 a month where you will have then the advanced AI tools such as smart search, field models, table models, and also Transcribus sites as well as some collaboration tools, which we will introduce uh, yeah, at the beginning of 2024. And then there's also organization tools, which are tailored toward the users that are using transcribers on a larger scale. And their prices will be also be tailored towards those use cases. We also try to uh, not forget where we come from. We have our roots in the academic scene and also try to give back as much as possible. That's why we have that scholarship program where we try to support uh, students. So 
aspiring researchers basically and also teachers to use dress tribus um, we have supported um, as of now about 300 projects so um, very often they are thesis projects or other research projects by students where they need to extract some historical information and use transcribos for that specific purpose. Um, so yeah, if you're a student or if you're a teacher and eligible for that program, we, yeah, we're happy if you will get your request as well. And now just a brief uh, sentence or a couple of sentences about transcribo sites, a new tool that we're introducing soon. It's already available to try it out on beta as well as table and field models. And that is basically like a small content management system where you can share your material that you have in Transcribus with the world, basically. You can see, you can easily share material. You can set up a side-by-side -side view as in the editor for everyone. So you can share a Transcribus site, which is basically a website where you can share your material and also make it searchable. So those search capabilities that you have in Transcribus, they will then also be available for the users of your Transcribus site and make the yeah, very valuable work that you're doing with the historical material visible, as you can, for instance, set up a um, yeah, digital edition and work on that material, share it with transcribal sites quite easily, and give everybody access to the full content of your transcribal site. There are already a lot of transcribal sites online, and we have also some very nice uh, examples where that material really led some, to some new discoveries like a uh, yeah, long unknown uh, Rembrandt painting that was found based to the content of a Transcribus site um, yeah, about two years ago. And now the, the, the big change here is that this will now be available for everybody. Everybody can set up their Transcribus site. You can see how that might look like. And once you search something, you will see the search hits then in the Transcribus site. Yeah, summing up and then coming to the questions because there are a number of questions and we will try to address them all. Um, yeah, we are very happy to get your requests to be here for you. We also have an extensive help center where you can try to find uh, answers yourself. We will try to update it as frequently as possible with all the new tools that we're launching. Not all the information is always perfectly up to date. We're giving our best since we're still a small team it's not always perfectly easy to have everything up to date, but yeah, Sarah and Helene are also doing a great job here and in communicating everything that we're introducing in terms of product management and in terms of development. Um, yeah, and we're also always happy to be tagged on, on X or Twitter, as you might know it, um, and also on other social platforms. You can probably find us on the most common platforms once more, a uh, short reminder before we come to the questions. Uh, as said at the beginning, we will have our user conference at mid-February 2024. It will be hybrid, so in-person and online. If you're interested, check it out. And we're happy to welcome you in Transcribus or also welcome you online. There were a lot of participants during the first um, hybrid conference that we made in 2022 in September. So we're happy to share the insights and the topic of this and the previous user conference is the future of information extraction. Here we will really have a lot of very interesting talks about the topic, how you can extract data from historical document and yeah, what the future of extracting information from those sources will bring. Now, <clears throat> sorry, let's come to the questions from the Q&A. Um, I have already had them before, so I briefly or quickly can go through them. There was a question about column sets. They will also work with Transcribus in theory. Transcribus is customizable to your material, so you can use Transcribus for whatever material you would like. We have a very nice example, for instance, with the Wikimedia Foundation, where they were working with palm leaves, where um, the writing was basically on palm leaves, and that seems to work out quite nicely. So a nice project together with the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, yeah, with the doc ex export, the page break and line break option, they are basically, as far as I know, already available. So I'm not 100% sure about the question, but we can maybe address that later again. Um, 
Then there is material regard our question regarding the material that is just a specification. So I think that's also addressed. Um, then regarding the top N guesses, that's something I said that is only available if you enable smart search. For now, you can not see the top N guesses. We will introduce that. For now, only the search basically uses the top N guesses. So it depends, it's between 10 and 100 for, for token. So it will be uh, not a fixed amount of different variants per word that is stored with the smart search, but we will also extend that functionality that you can get also the top N guesses for a token and then um, decide yourself, which is the best guess. Um, then for the exporting, so basically everything in Transcribe is, is exportable, but the model. So as you have access to all the training data, then of course you can theoretically also export the training data and train a model on another platform. So in theory, you can export everything. Um, so the train set can be exported, but the model itself is not exportable at the moment. Um, I think the question regarding uh, split line has already been answered in the chat as far as I've seen. So you can merge lines. If they are split, you can just select both lines, uh, hit the M key on your keyboard, and then you can merge them. Um, then there's a question regarding community documents of the late 19th and 20th century. So I'm pretty sure that you can work with them. There are also, and that's probably the biggest set of public models that is available you know, for the German language. So you can work on those models with those uh, models. And also the text Titan is uh, handling mixed scripts very well. So you can handle printed and handwritten documents at the same time, which um, standard models are only capable of doing to some extent. So you can mix some material in the models, but mainly um, the text Titan is the go-to if you have mixed material. Um, then regarding the free account, I think I've addressed that with the new subscription model. So everything that, or almost everything that you have seen will remain free, but the extra, uh, yeah, advanced AI tools and transcribal sites, they will be part of the higher tier subscription plan. And yeah, I said with a hundred free credits, you can process about a hundred pages a month. Um, then reordering text regions should also be possible. So you can reorder text regions as I've shown similar to text lines um, that should be available through the text editor in the edit, edit pane where I've shown how you can reorder the text lines. You can reorder text regions as well. And you can also um, move lines from one region to another region because I think that question was in the chat as well. Then there's a question regarding note code. I've not directly have the link now, but there was a very interesting session about note code at the last user conference which is on our YouTube channel. So you can basically just check out that uh, that's basically the most elaborate uh, tutorial we have at the moment in relation to node code. Um, then regarding if a model can train abbreviations, I think that's a question you can very nicely answer, Sarah, if you want to address that question. Yes. So if a model can train, <clears throat> so I can drink something. I must try yes. And it's possible to uh, train a, a model. So there are three different uh, uh, solutions that you can options. So the first is to transcribe uh, the abbreviation as they are, and you get just get a, a diplomatic transcription. The second one is uh, to transcribe the abbreviation and tag it and write uh, the, the property. And then uh, when you train the model and then under advanced settings, uh, you can toggle the option uh, uh, train abbreviation with this expansion. And the model will learn uh, to find the abbreviation, tag them, uh, and write and add uh, the appropriate expansion uh, as uh, a property of the tag. Uh, you just need to remember that uh, it works uh, when uh, the abbreviation are very frequent. So if an abbreviated word appears only once uh, in your ground root, uh, it could be difficult uh, for transcribers to learn them that if you have very frequent abbreviations, uh, uh, it can do that. So remember to have a good sample of the abbreviations in your ground route. Um, 
And the last option is to solve the abbreviations uh, and uh, teach transcribers to solve them uh, too. And there is a, a model, for instance, trained by the University of Toronto for uh, medieval Latin. Uh, and that model is capable to solve a very complex abbreviations uh, uh, because it, the ground truth uh, um, is what trained that way. So all the abbreviations were solved in the ground truth uh, and transcribers learn uh, that. Thank you very much. Um, then there's a question regarding the vocabulary of a model. At the moment, it's not possible to retrieve the vocabulary. Um, this is rather a user interface um, matter. So we could theoretically work on something like that. So we will definitely take note of this and then maybe um, come up with a solution regarding that question. For the table analysis, um, there's a question if the tables need to be 100% homogeneous. And that's basically the nice, nice thing about the table uh, recognition and then also the table models. They don't need to be perfectly homogeneous. It then depends on the training data. Of course, the models that are trained on the tables should reflect the tables that you are trying to recognize, but they don't need to be 100% to be homogeneous. So they, there can, can be uh, quite some amount of variation in the training data. Of course, depending on how many uh, tables there are. As I said, you can also theoretically train different types of tables in the same model, but then obviously you need to more, add more training data. Then uh, there's a question regarding private models. Um, how can users reuse other people's models? So a model is always linked to a collection at the moment. So once you train a model, that model is linked in that collection. If you want to give access to that model to someone else, we might change that soon, uh, but at the moment it is like that. You just need to give them access to that collection. And once they have access to that collection, they will also be able to access the models in that collection. So if you want to share that model, uh, easy ways to train that model in a collection um, that is kind of clear that you can share with other people, and then you can just share that collection with other users. Um, then there's a question regarding the PC software. So I guess you're talking about the expert clients or the desktop client that is currently available, which is basically a transcriber's version, which has even more features at the moment. That was the version of transcriber's that was developed back during the project times. It's a very extensive tool. We, uh, Helene has briefly addressed that uh, issue, but it was built during a research project without uh, yeah, focusing on user experience and also focusing about how a product should be designed to be useful for a broader user base. The learning curve is curve is really flat. So if you want to learn how to use the expert client, it takes you quite a lot of time. Once you're used to it, it's a really powerful tool and it will therefore not be gone very quickly. But the goal, the eventual goal is to really build one software that can, yeah, on the one hand, be very intuitive and be used by a broad user base, but on the other hand, also handle all those expert tasks the current desktop software is capable of handling. So there's a lot of very tiny and nitty gritty, but very helpful features in there. And we will, yeah, step by step also introduce, yeah, most of them at least in the web based software as well. And then the web based software will also be. Yeah, downloadable uh, to be a desktop app again. Um, just group of sites, open access. Yeah, that's something that we, that's why also it's still on beta. So the um, open access is still a topic that needs to be addressed. Of course, at the moment, once a just group of site is published, it is basically open for access. It's not open app access, but it's open to access by the general public. But we will still then um, introduce a system where uh, transcriber site owners can define the license, the data that is shared in a transcriber site um, holds, basically. And I think, are you already going to answer the last one, right, Sarah? As I've seen that you're typing. Yes, uh, um, it's possible to. Um, customize a, a, a tag. Uh, I would suggest to add a tag uh, spelling uh, or modern spelling, and in, with, you can create a property 
uh, modernized form uh, and add it uh, as a, a tag. Okay. Perfect. There was one last question. Yeah, that's a very good question. So correct error rate is the current uh, metric to show you how a model performs. It is measured as the name says, says based on characters. There's also a word error rate that is kind of uh, used in the background. And you can also see that in the in the expert client. Um, but yes, the character error rate is not a perfect measure. So um, as Sarah also all, uh, already explained, um, it's yeah consider to test it really on your material and see how the performance is on your material and not just rely on the character rate because that is very subjective to the material it was tested on so to the validation set so depending on what pages you add to the validation set also the character the error rate will largely vary so here it's really advised to consider how um the character rate is built so therefore always trying out the model is the best approach here, seeing how it performs. We will introduce more advanced uh, quality control tools soon. We already have some in our internal testing. So those will also then maybe add more yes. functionality to evaluate models and to understand how well a model performs for your material. Having said that, I think we have addressed a lot of questions. Maybe there are some unsolved, so I, uh, there were so many questions that I could not follow all of them in the chat, but I think Helena did a great job answering most of them in the chat already. If there might be some unsolved questions or issues, just write us an email. I said, we're always happy to help. Um, it's really great to have such a yeah huge turnout. We're still more than a hundred people and are already running almost 20 minutes late. So sorry for that, that we took a little bit longer of your, um, yeah, very uh, long, afternoon but we hope it was informative we hope it gave you a good an overview of what transcribus is capable of there's a lot of more features to be discovered we have tried to give you an overview of the most important ones um but we will be yeah as i said very happy if you kind of join us on our journey as we always say we are unlocking the past and we're doing that together so that's our vision and everybody that joins that vision is yeah, always welcome together with Transcribus. So thanks a lot. I hope you have a nice evening. If you are in Europe, if not, then I hope you have a nice day. And if you're in the Pacific or uh, yeah, Oceania region, thank you for sharing your night with us. So there's always users around the globe joining, which is really great and really shows how passionate everybody is about this. Thanks a lot and see you soon then.